So with apologies then to the notices, I think that what is right for me to do today is to spend the day with the phrase, God remembered. God remembered Noah and God remembered Abraham. We've been thinking about this on a Sunday night. We've been looking at the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. And uh, it just seems to me that, I don't know, you can never claim, can you, and confidently that God wants you to do anything other than what he's told you in his word. But it seems to me that the right thing for us to do today is to spend the day with the phrase, God remembered. So I'd like to turn this morning to Genesis 8, and we'll read the opening verses there. And we'll couple that with uh, Genesis 19, and the verse that says God remembered Abraham. And what we'll do this morning is we'll set the scene, and uh, then tonight we'll think about what it means to be remembered by God. So often on a Sunday, we'll set the scene on a Sunday morning, and then we'll focus in on a Sunday evening. And we are doing that again, it seems, this morning. So Genesis 8, then, to begin with, uh, reading it from verse 1, and then we'll turn across into Genesis 19. So Genesis 8, God remembered Noah and every living thing and all the animals that were with him in the ark. And God made a wind to pass over the earth, and the waters subsided. The fountains of the deep and the windows of heaven were also stopped, and the rain from heaven was restrained. And the waters receded continually from the earth. At the end of the 150 days, the waters decreased. Then the ark rested in the seventh month, the 17th day of the month, on the mountains of Ararat. And the waters decreased continually until the 10th month. In the 10th month, on the first day of the month, the tops of the mountains were seen. So it came to pass at the end of 40 days that Noah opened the window of the ark which he had made. Then he sent out a raven, which kept going to and fro until the waters had dried up from the earth. He also sent out for himself a dove to see if the waters had receded from the face of the ground. But the dove found no resting place for the sole of her foot. And so she returned to the ark to Noah, for the waters were on the face of the whole earth. So he put out his hand and took her and drew her into the ark to himself. He waited yet another seven days, and again he sent the dove out from the ark. Then the dove came to him in the evening, and behold, a freshly plucked olive leaf was in her mouth. And Noah knew that the waters had receded from the earth. So he waited another seven days and sent out the dove, which did not return again to him anymore. So the first verse says, God remembered Noah. And if you then turn across to Genesis 19, after the story of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah being destroyed, you have verse 29. So this is Genesis 19 and verse 29. It came to pass when God destroyed the cities of the plain, that God remembered Abraham and sent Lot out of the midst of the overthrow, when he overthrow, overthrew the cities in which Lot had lived. So God remembers Noah and God remembers Abraham. Let's ask God to remember us. Lord our God, you are the same God who remembered Noah, and you were the same God who remembered Abraham. And what we've set for ourselves today is to think about what it means to be remembered by you, our God. And so to do that, we need to set the scene this morning, and we ask that you would help us to do so. Lord, we have your word in front of us, and we are dealing with very well-known 
narratives, we would call them stories, except that word often has connotations of children and something made up. Lord, we have the flood, <coughs> which we know, <coughs> and maybe <coughs> we've known all our lives. We have the story of Sodom and Gomorrah, which again is known and in many places ridiculed and thought of as nonsense and harsh. Lord, as we take these together this morning, we ask, Lord, that you would help us to hear your word, whatever age we are, whatever the past week has been like, whatever our experiences at home, uh, at work, whatever's going on for us, our God, in our minds or in our hearts, Lord, your word is light and your word is truth and your word is health uh, and your word is a revelation of who you are as God. So we ask you then, our God, whether we are nine or 90, to hear your word this morning May it come with power and light and heat and strength to all of us. And Lord, the problem is so often in our heads, between our ears, our ears themselves. Lord, we can put up great resistance to your word. And Lord, our minds are the most amazing things. And in some ways, our minds are impenetrable. Lord, we can shut the door fast against your light and your truth. And we can even do that whilst calling ourselves Christians. So, Lord, we ask you to, to hear us and to speak to us and to overcome whatever barrier we put in place today. Lord, may your Holy Spirit who, to whom there are no barriers, may he work effectively and powerfully amongst us all as we commend ourselves in Jesus' name. Amen. So I've mentioned then that for a few Sunday nights now, we've been looking at the story of Sodom uh, and Gomorrah. It's a story about Abraham. And the story begins with uh, <clears throat> three men, one of whom is the Lord, arriving in Mamre, where Abraham was living. And uh, Abraham sat at the tent, uh, the door of his tent. These three men come along. Abraham recognizes one as the Lord. And there's this conversation. And the conversation is an announcement that a year from now, Abraham will conceive and the long-awaited son will be born. And that bit of the story is a, is a sort of aside. And you get the main story. And the main story is the Lord looking across the plains to Sodom. And he starts to think aloud. And he's pondering and he's saying to himself, shall I let Abraham in on what I'm about to do? And we followed from there and we've seen what the Lord says to Abraham. We've seen how Abraham responds. We've seen that the Lord then returns to heaven. His two companions walk across the plain and they arrive at Sodom at night. They go to the open square. There's Lot, uh, Abraham's nephew, uh, sitting at the gate. He recognizes the two men as visitors, brings them into his home, and so on. Now, we follow that story. And uh, what we've seen is that we are meant to compare it to the story of Noah and the flood. There's all sorts of clues in the way that the Sodom story is recounted that would link it in to the story of Noah and the flood. So Moses, we believe, is the author of Genesis. Moses wants us to compare the story of Sodom and Gomorrah and the story of the flood. So I'm going to do that this morning. And uh, we're very used to comparing things now, aren't we, in our Bibles. We know what to look out for in order to make these comparisons. But I want you to hold in mind that the only reason I'm doing this is so that we can focus down on what the phrase God remembered, what it means. We've seen that God remembered Noah, Genesis 8, verse 1. Genesis 19, God remembers Abraham. What does that mean? 
And I want to focus down on it so that you and I, as God's people, by the end of today, understand that God remembers us. But what's that like? What does it mean? What's involved in being remembered by God? So let's set the scene then. And uh, these two stories are also linked, and we've seen that, linked to the Tower of Babel. But let's forget about that this morning. We're going to look at Noah, and we're going to look at Abraham. Noah and the flood, Abraham, Sodom, and Gomorrah. And I've, I've got to list you. I don't do very well these days with lists, so let's give it a go. I want us to see what the parallels are <clears throat> in the stories of the flood and Sodom and Gomorrah. And let's begin with the most obvious. In both these accounts, we have the story of human sinfulness. So in Genesis 6, you read that the thoughts and the intents of the human heart is evil continually. Genesis 6 outlines for us how God regrets creating that because the evil that is in the heart of men and women. Human sinfulness. And then the story of Sodom is exactly the same. You have it in Genesis 13. It's again in Genesis 18. The outcry of Sodom has reached the Lord. The sinfulness, the wickedness, of those cities on the plain had reached the Lord and he comes down to see. So what we are being uh, confronted with this morning is human sinfulness, degrees of human sinfulness. Both occasions represent extraordinary human sinfulness. Not just, if you like, your everyday human sinfulness but these are moments in our history when sinfulness had reached the point where god responds in judgment so that's how both stories start you have whole human sin and then the second thing to notice and we've touched on this already in genesis 6 in Genesis 18, you have these unique moments when we are introduced to God thinking aloud. We are brought into the mind of God as God contemplates how to respond to human sinfulness. So in Genesis 6, there's God reflecting on human behavior, We've said that he regrets having made men and women in his image. In Genesis 18, there's the Lord standing by Abraham and again reflecting on what's going on in Sodom. How the men of that city, the other cities, how they're behaving, how they're living. The Lord thinks aloud on these occasions. And these are unique moments when we are invited into the mind of God. And what's really interesting, I think, is it's one of the marks of a prophet, when a prophet is uh, invited into God's mind, when God shares his thoughts with a human being. He only shares his thoughts with prophets. And so we are in the place of a prophet when we have access into the thought and the mind of God. So we've got human sinfulness, we've got the Lord reflecting, and then in both accounts, there is one family who finds favor with God. Clearly now, it doesn't need much saying, does it? In the first, the flood, Noah and his family find favor with God. Genesis 6 verse 8, we just have this wonderful verse, it's a one-liner, Noah finds grace in the sight of God. With Sodom, Gomorrah, those other cities, it's Lot who finds favour with God. And as you read the story, you keep this um, emphasis on the fact that Lot finds favour, Lot has mercy. 
God's mercy extends to Lot. So we've got two families. And those families are very similar. And they're listed in very similar ways. So out of all the population, there's one family here and there's one family there. And what you're meant to do is to say, wow, out of all this vast human multitude, there's one family here and there's one family over there. So can you see the connections? I'll give you a few more. There's the connection in both accounts in relation to rain. Now, we are very, um, very clear, I guess, that Noah and the flood is about rain. And uh, you can see the emphasis there on the, the rain, the heavens are opened, and even the great deep is open. But we're all used to the idea, aren't we, that there is rain in the flood narrative. But if you turn just for a moment, <clears throat> excuse me, turn to Genesis 19, and uh, you'll see in verse uh, 24 that you've got the same being emphasized. So Genesis 19 now, this is the story of Sodom and Gomorrah. Verse 24, then the Lord rained brimstone and fire at Sodom and Gomorrah from the Lord out of the heavens. Now that's an exact replication of what goes on with the flood. The Lord raining from heaven down upon the cities of the plain. So this is Moses very clearly tying these two sentence, uh, two stories together. You have the Lord raining from heaven in the, the flood account and the Lord raining from heaven with the cities of the plain. Do you see the connections there? In both Genesis 7, Genesis 19, you have the emphasis on ruin. Now, it's not in my translation. I doubt if it's in yours. You'll have the word destruction, but the Hebrew word is ruin. God brings ruin upon the whole world through the story of um, Noah, and then God brings ruin on the cities of the plain when you come to Sodom and Gomorrah. There's this emphasis on ruin. And then the, the next step, as I see it, is you have one family being saved in the flood account, and you have one family being saved out of the stories of the cities. Now, it's not a coincidence, is it, that you can make these very clear connections between the stories. And if Moses wants you to do that, which I think he does, it's so that we can arrive at the whole thrust of both of these accounts. What are they there for? And what are we meant to do with them? So we are doing what's called panelling. Now, this word panelling, I want you to think about maybe a wardrobe, which two panel doors, or maybe you've got some uh, thing in the kitchen, you've got two panels. Now, that's what Moses is doing. You've got the flood panel, and you've got the Sodom and Gomorrah one. What a wonderful way to refer to both. And as you put them together like that, you see how they reflect each other. You see the connections between them, the similarities. You're looking at them. And you're seeing how they are, are there side by side for you to think about and, and to learn from. So you sin and God thinking, and then you've got God choosing one family, then you've got ruin and so on. And then just one family is saved here, another is saved there. The families are described in similar ways. You've got Noah, his wife, his sons and, and their wives. You've got Lot and his wife, his daughters and their husbands. So there's a little change there. What's that all about? But you've got very similar descriptions. And then what we have is after both disasters, what happens? I'm sure you know, if you turn to Genesis 19, after the flood, there's Noah and his family, 
And we have an account of how Noah gets drunk. And he's so drunk that he passes out and he lies naked on the floor. So this man who's been chosen by God, found favor with God, who is rescued from a great ruin by God, this man, when it's all over, he gets drunk and he passes out. And you have the account of how his sons go into the place where Noah is just passed out on the floor and how they respond. And of course, one of the sons doesn't respond in a very good way. So you've got wine and drunkenness and children. That's the story of Noah. After Sodom and Gomorrah is destroyed and Lot is saved and his wife isn't, but never mind, there's Lot and his daughters, they're in a cave up in the mountains. What happens? And of course, what you have is another story of wine and drunkenness. And so these stories are absolutely mirroring each other. Both heads of the houses, both patriarchs, are drunk. Both pass out. When it comes to Lot, he was made drunk by his daughters. And of course, what you have there, I don't want to talk about it, but what you have in Genesis 19 are the two daughters with their dad in a cave up a mountain. The world looks like it's been destroyed. So to them, the whole world looks like it's over. It's just a mass of, of smoke and heat and ruin. To the three of them in our cave, it looks like it's all over. So the two girls get that drunk. But whatever the reason for doing that, I don't want to talk about that today. I just want you to notice the parallels. Noah's drunk, Lot is drunk. The children are the ones that seem to be involved. There seems to be a theme of children doing things that they shouldn't do. And there's consequences for both. So just before we do one last parallel and, and bring things to a close, I want to say this to you. Both these accounts are Old Testament representations of what it means to be saved. They are not um, little kind of ideas of the future when God will judge the world. It's not that. Both Noah and Lot are pictures of what it means to be saved, what it means to pass through the wrath of God. So for Noah, in his ark, he becomes a type of Christian who is in the ark of Christ. And Christ shields you and protects you and covers you and keeps you safe as the, the wrath of God comes down upon you. So, so it's a salvation imagery. So Noah is a type of believer. He's experienced God's salvation. And it's the same for Lot. Abraham prays for the city and Lot is rescued. So Lot, again, is a symbol of what it means to be saved. Saved from the wrath of God by the intercession, the prayers of Christ. Christ who prays for us so we are rescued from God's wrath and we are delivered. So these are types of salvation stories, what it means to be a saved human being. But I think it's interesting, isn't it? When it comes to, to Noah, he's experienced God's salvation. And then he seems to feel the burden of being a saved person who's a father. He feels the responsibilities of being a father and his children having experienced God's salvation. So he then becomes a type of believer who struggles with and seeks to live 
the salvation he's had, but in the difficulties of life. In this world in which they're the only ones left. And it's all down to them. And they have to start again. And it's all go from then. It's the responsibilities that he struggles with. And it's that burden of being a believer, responsible for his family, that seems to break Noah at that point. So he's a believer, he's experienced God's salvation, he's got the responsibility now, and he feels the weight and the burden of that as he carries on with his life. When it comes to Lot, the focus is on the children. What's it like to be a child when your family have been saved? What's it like to be a child of a believing father or mother? And there you are in this world, man, there's just you left, nobody else. Where will you get your husbands from? Where will you get your partners from? Where will you get your friends from? How are you going to get on with life? when you alone are the family that's been saved from the wrath of God. And so what you see in the Lot story is the difficulties of being a child of a saved family and the loneliness and the challenge and the burden and the hardship of being a saved child in this bleak and abandoned world that has gone through the wrath of God. So you see the similarities. You then have this picture of if you've been saved, well, surely it's plain sailing. Surely if you've been rescued and you've seen the world flooded and, and you are now there and you're starting again, surely it's gonna be plain sailing for you. But it's not. And, and Noah finds it all too much. Similarly, for Lot and his daughters, you'd think, wouldn't you, that having been saved from Sodom and you've gone over to Zoa and then you've gone up into the mountains, you'd think that you'd be grateful, you'd be happy, you'd be rejoicing, you'd be, you know, smiling away every day, gosh, we are saved, and you're not, because it's hard and it's difficult and it's lonely and it's challenging and you don't know what tomorrow will bring and you can't see the future. Those are the challenges for saved families in both the Noah and the Lot narrative. So similarities then, let's come to the one that we've wanting to focus on. And that's this very obvious connection between the two. God remembered Noah, Genesis 8 verse 1, as we've seen. And then Genesis 19 verse 29, God remembered Abraham. Both accounts are telling you what it means to be remembered by God. So Noah, who has the instruction to build the ark, and then he's left to it. He hears very little. And when he's locked in the ark with all the animals and his family, God is silent. And then as they float for 150 days, God is silent. And then Noah, uh, Noah has to make these decisions. Is it over? Is it safe? He opens the window, sets out the raven. What's it like out there? Is it going to end? And Noah, as he goes through all these actions of sending out this bird, then that bird, and then waiting, he doesn't hear from God at all. What does it mean to be remembered by God? And Abraham, as we've seen, he pleads for Sodom and Gomorrah. He stands before God and he says, if there are 50 righteous, will you spare the city? And he goes from 50 to 40 to 30 to 10. If there are 10 righteous, will you spare the city? Abraham knows that his nephew Lot and Lot's family live in Sodom and Gomorrah. So he prays for them. God, will you spare them? Will you have mercy on them? And Abraham prays, God goes back to heaven, the two men go on to Sodom and Gomorrah, and Abraham's left there. He's at his tent, he's in Mamre, 
And the next morning, he looks out across the plain and he sees the destruction of the cities. The entire plain looks like a nuclear bomb has dropped. So it's not difficult to imagine it's sunrise. So you can imagine the smoke filling the skies, the blackness and the dust. And as Abraham looks, we saw this last Sunday night, Abraham has no idea what's happened to Lot and his family. He doesn't know. Now we know because we've been told, but Lot doesn't know, uh, Abraham doesn't know. So he looks over and all he sees is destruction and death. And he's no idea what's happened to Lot. Did God answer his prayers? Well, God certainly didn't spare the cities, did he? Because there was Abraham asking God, spare the city if you can find 10 righteous. And God says, okay, I'll spare the city for the sake of 10. So when Abraham ends that prayer and the two men go off to Sodom and the Lord goes back to heaven and Abraham stays at his tent, he's under the impression that God will spare the city for the sake of 10. Next day when he looks, it's all ruin. It's all disaster. So what happened to his praise? What happened to what God said? What happened to Lot? Abraham doesn't know. And as a family last Sunday, we were talking about this and we saw that Abraham never meets Lot again. Abraham never gets to know what's happened to Lot. There is no record of the meeting. So what does it mean to be remembered by God? You have silence for days where God says nothing. You go through a flood. You're locked in an ark. God says nothing. What does it mean to be remembered by God? You pray for those you love. You've got no idea whether they've been saved. You never see them again. What does it mean to be remembered by God? Well, to set up that then, let's turn to Genesis 9. And I want to read some verses to you. And we'll take these verses together and we'll get the clues from it as we then move towards tonight. So Genesis 9 and verse 8. God spoke to Noah, this is after the flood, and to his sons with him saying, as for me, Behold, I establish my covenant with you and with your descendants after you. And with every living creature that is with you, the birds, the cattle, and every beast of the earth with you, of all that go out of the ark, every beast of the earth. I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off by the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. God said, this is the sign of the covenant which I make between me and you. Every living creature that is with you forever. I set my rainbow in the cloud and it shall be for the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. It shall be when I bring a cloud over the earth that the rainbow shall be seen in the cloud and I will remember my covenant, which is between me and you and every creature of all flesh. The water shall never again become a flood to destroy all the earth. So have you got your answer then? What does it mean to be remembered? And of course the answer is in that wonderful word and it's a difficult word, it's the word covenant. The word remember is a covenant word. And do you remember a covenant is an agreement that God has set up between himself and someone else. Marriage is a covenant. It's an agreement. So what God is saying here is this. God has set up an agreement with Noah. And God remembers that agreement. God sets up a covenant with Abraham. 
and God remembers that covenant. God has set up a covenant with the world in which we live. And God remembers that agreement every time there's a rainbow in the sky. So the word is from covenant. And so what I want us to understand today is God has an agreement with every one of us. He has made a covenant with us. And that covenant contains promise. And God himself, who is the everlasting God, the maker of heaven and earth, the eternal God, he has promised in that agreement that he has with you and me. And when we read that God remembers Abraham and Noah, and God remembers us, it's a shorthand way of saying that God will always, remain faithful to that covenant that covenant with its promises god is committed to god is faithful to and god will unfailingly keep his promise to his people whether you're in an ark whether there's a flood whether you're feeling burdened with the responsibilities whether you are rescued from a city that's been set alight whether you're in a cave in a mountain and don't forget lot has lost everything all his flocks all his wealth all his servants everything he's lost everything in fact next to job lot is the character in the bible who loses everything so whether you lose everything but save your life god is faithful to his promise and God remembers that covenant. So God has set up a covenant with you and me. The, the promise is that he shall be our God and we shall be his people. His promise is that he shall forgive us for all our sins. We have promise of eternal life. We have the promise of a home in heaven with Christ, that we should be like him. We have the promise of his grace and his forgiveness and his mercy and his compassion. All these promises God has made to us. Those who believe his son, that's the condition, belief in the son of God. And God remembers. God will always remember and be true to, and be faithful to, the covenant that he has set up with you and me. Well, we'll think more about that this evening.